Bakadir Jalilov moves to 11-0, this time with an eighth round KO of Jack Mulawai, who is a Congolese fighter based in Belgium. Now, this is the third time I've seen Jalilov fight. The first time was on this show right here in Uzbekistan, where Jalilov is from, against this guy called Zutis. That fight only went two rounds. I didn't see the fight after that. I did see the Sokolovsky fight. He managed to stop him in Dubai earlier on this year. And of course, this fight here against Mulawai. Now, for those of you who don't know, if we can just have a look at his uh, amateurs here, he was the Olympic gold medal winner at the Tokyo Games. And because of the rule change, he was actually fighting professional at the same time as still competing as an amateur. And many of you are going to have mixed feelings about that, whether you think that should even be allowed. He also fought in the World Series of Boxing, so he's a highly accomplished, highly experienced amateur. Very interesting, actually, looking through his amateur record, because in recent years, he's just been absolutely killing it and beating everybody convincingly, it would seem, just going off what it says on paper here. The last loss he suffered, according to BoxRec in the amateurs, was to a guy called Jose La Duet, and that is a Cuban fighter. He lost a split decision over five in the World Series of Boxing. Prior to that, he lost to this Eastern European guy whose surname I will not attempt to pronounce on a split decision, and he fought this guy a number of times in the amateurs and lost to him a, num a number of times. Also lost to this La Duet again back in 2017. So that's another loss to him. There's that other Eastern European guy who's from Uzbekistan as well. Uh, he managed to defeat him on a majority decision that time, fought him again in 2017, lost to him. So yeah, this is definitely a rival of his from Uzbekistan who he's fought multiple times. You go back through his uh, record again, Ivan Ditchko. He fought Ivan Ditchko a total of four times as far as I can tell. And he lost to Ditchko all four times. He lost to Joe Joyce in the Rio Olympics. Some of you guys may remember that. Again, there's another loss to Ditchko. There's another loss to Ditchko. For those of you who don't know Ivan Ditchko, he was a guy that Anthony Joshua fought in the 2012 London Olympics. Anthony Joshua beat him. Uh, who else have we got here? There's so many, of course, Eastern European names and Uzbek fighters and what have you. I'm trying to find the other uh, losses. Of course, he's beaten Fraser Clark a couple of times, beaten the, in the Olympics, also beaten back in 2014. There's the other loss to Ditchko again there. You see, he lost the total, as far as I can tell, of four times to Ivan Ditchko. But these fights were several years ago, and he's been... Or he, or he was as an amateur, seemingly on a long unbeaten streak since 2018, where he was just running through everybody. But he didn't face any of the guys who he really had issues with during this streak. I guess they'd turned pro by then, as in Ivan Ditchko and the Cuban La Duet. So yeah, those are the guys who seem to be causing him problems, but they turned pro and they allowed him to dominate in the amateur ranks from there on in. And after turning pro, as I say, he turned pro 2018, but was simultaneously fighting amateur. <laughs> okay, because the, uh, the Olympics were, were they last year? The Tokyo Olympics? It was last year, wasn't it? Because it was supposed to be 2020 and then it got put off to 2021. Yeah, it was last year. So yeah, since turning pro, he's racked up 11 wins, all 11 by knockout. For those of you who ain't seen him fight, he's a big tool. Uzbek Southpaw, he says, at least according to the commentators on a fight I watched yesterday, that he is inspired by the Klitschko's stylistically. And you can definitely see that in Jalilov's style and in, in his whole approach to the, the sport. Because here against uh, Mulawai, he wasn't going hell for leather to try and get the guy out of there. He was mostly concentrating on trying to frustrate the guy and get the guy to walk into shots. And he did that very successfully. I thought that Jelilov's poise was very good. I thought his range was excellent. I thought his footwork was very good. And I saw improvements actually, because last time I saw him against Sokolovsky and more so against this Zutis guy, 
to me, he looked a little mechanical. He looked a little bit, I don't know, ungainly. Not terribly stiff or anything like that, but he just looked a little mechanical to me. This time against Mulaway, he looked far more fluid, uh, far more smooth in his movements. And I thought that his uh, mobility was actually very impressive for a guy of this size. Bear in mind, he's 6'7", 251 pounds. Now, his opponent, Mulaway, was very limited, certainly very game, but limited. He tried to press forward and land some big shots, but he was far too unskilled to be able to get anything done. And he was frustrated. He was buzzed multiple times, but he kept pressing forward and trying to make things happen. Eventually, and uh, Jalilov, by the way, was taunting uh, Mulawai in the fight. He was taunting him, telling him, come on and showboating and stuff like that. So he is that kind of guy. If you're not into showboating fighters, that might annoy you about him. I don't know. Personally, I don't mind showboating. He was golden the guy and he eventually finished the fight with a left hand first to the body and then he doubled up and threw it to the head. I thought it was a real nice move there by Jalilov because he wasn't throwing that shot too often. He wasn't showing that shot too often. He was throwing the left hand a lot, but I'm talking about doubling it up, throwing it to the body and then throwing it up to the head or throwing it to the chest and then to the face. He wasn't doing that too often. So he got the opponent into, I guess, a full sense of security thinking, okay, the left hand has landed on my chest. I don't need to worry so much about my face now. Now's my opportunity to land my own shot. Oh no, it isn't because the left hand is coming straight back to your face. And that's what ended the fight. So I thought it was a real nice finish by Jalilov and overall a very, very good performance. Obviously, moving forward, he's going to fight much stiffer competition than this. And I do want to see him in there against maybe a smaller guy, a mover. Well, this guy was a smaller guy, but he weren't a mover. Somebody smaller and more skilled. And also, we need to see what his stamina is like. I mean, he didn't seem to have any stamina issues here, but of course, he weren't getting hit and he was fighting pretty much at his own pace. He was dictating everything. He was clinching well when he had to clinch, con completely controlling things in the clinch. Seems tremendously strong up close, very poised, never flustered at any point. So we do need to see him in there against someone that can give him some issues, someone that can apply more effective pressure. And as I say, maybe a mover, a smaller guy who's going to maybe ask questions of his coordination and his balance because he looked very well coordinated and balanced here against a crude, pretty sluggish opponent. But when he's in there against someone who's much faster and more athletic than Mulawai, he may not look so fluid and coordinated. So. Again, these are all questions that have to be answered as well as stamina, heart, chin, and all this kind of stuff. But obviously, when a guy has an Olympic gold medal and when he has such deep amateur experience, he's definitely been asked some of the questions that I'm talking about in the amateur ranks already and certainly in the WSB. And he's probably passed many of those tests with flying colors. So this looks like one of the guys or somebody who's going to be one of the main guys in the heavyweight division in the years to come, along with the Jared Andersons, potentially Daniel Dubois and uh, several of our up and coming heavyweights at the moment. So that's my take on his performance against Jack Mulaway. I thought it was a good performance. He controlled the action from start to finish. He was never flustered. He didn't get hit with anything clean. And yeah, he just applied those clinch goal type tactics, just frustrate the hell out of the opponent and get them to walk into stuff, get them to become ragged and then punish them for it. He didn't use his jab as much as you would see clinch goal. Both clinch goals use their jab, particularly Vladimir. And again, he's a Southpaw rather than an Orthodox fighter. So maybe would have liked to have seen him use his jab a bit more if we want to be nitpicky about it. Uh, but he didn't really have to. And perhaps it's a case of necessity. When he feels like he needs to use his jab, maybe he'll use it more. Whereas in this fight, he was relying mostly on that backhand, the southpaw left. And the jab was there to kind of pour and control the opponent rather than do any damage, you know, for the most part. Let me know what you guys thought in the comments below of his performance if you saw it. If not, I'm sure it'll be available somewhere on YouTube 
And if you don't manage to watch this fight, there are definitely some of his other fights that you can watch on YouTube. Definitely one to watch out for in the future. He's now 11 and 0 with 11 KOs. And I do want to talk briefly about one of the undercard fights. And this was involving George Arias against Alante Green. Now, Arias first came onto my radar a few years ago. Some of you guys remember I did a few videos on him. And I thought he had some potential because boxing has been crying out for a short, aggressive heavyweight in the mold of a Joe Frazier or a Mike Tyson for a very, very long time now. And I certainly didn't come out and say that Arias is definitely going to be that guy, but I thought he had potential to maybe be that guy, depending on whether he could answer certain questions in the ring. Since that time, Arias has been very inactive. He's now 30 years of age, so he's no spring chicken at this point. Earlier on in his career, he was actually promoted by top rank. Uh, now I'm not sure who he's promoted by, but he has lived most of his career in the wilderness. I do not understand why. I do not know what's going on. And even more strange was from the Cassius Cheney fight. I haven't seen a lot of these other fights that he's had in recent years, uh, but I certainly saw the Cassius Cheney fight. Now, for those of you who hadn't seen Arias fight before, for most of his early career, he was a pressure fighter. And the thing that stood out to me about him was his energy. He would come to the ring bouncing all over the place. The opening bell would go and he was, you know, darting straight out, bobbing and weaving, very reminiscent stylistically of Joe Frazier, even though facially he looks like Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and he, he kind of has a very uh, upbeat, positive type of demeanor, you know, so interesting mix of personality and style and his look and all that kind of thing. So yeah, I thought that with that energy he had, with this tremendous energy levels where he's bouncing around the ring and coming forward and he looks very powerful. You know, he's about six feet tall. Actually on the telecast last night, they said he was 5'11". So uh, similar dimensions to a Mike Tyson, maybe a bit taller. And yeah, just tr tremendous energy levels. I thought, okay, this guy maybe stylistically is more similar to a Joe Frazier but high energy, powerful, big enough, I thought, for a 21st century small heavyweight, you know, in the same way that Mike Tyson was big enough for a 20th century small heavyweight. Uh, but subsequent to all that, as I say, he changed promoters, he's been in the wilderness, and then he reemerged on my radar in the Cassius Cheney fight. Now, Cheney was an unbeaten 21-0 prospect himself. And Cheney, if you look at Cheney's record, doesn't appear to be a massive puncher, but at six foot six, and if you've watched some of his uh, fights, he does have some pop in the right hand. And Arias, I, I didn't know whether maybe it sparred Cheney or something, but he fought completely different to how I'd seen him fight in the past as a pressure fighter. Against Cheney, he came out on the back foot. Bear in mind, Arias, again, is about 5'11", 6 foot, Cheney 6'5". Arias completely abandoned the pressure fighting style and was boxing on a back foot and counter punching. And he looked very awkward doing it. I don't know if any of you or how many of you have seen the George Foreman-Joe Frazier rematch <laughs> because that's what Joe Frazier tried to do in that fight. He tried to box on a back foot and of course, Joe Frazier is a pressure fighter. He looked extremely awkward and just weird boxing Foreman on the back foot. And indeed, it didn't work. He got, well he, well, he lasted longer than he did in the first fight, but he still ultimately got splattered. And uh, with George Arias, again, he looks very, very awkward fighting on the back foot. So going into this Alante Green fight, I was hoping that Arias would go back to his pressure fighting style. But no, against Alante Green, same thing, boxing on the back foot, moving around, counter punching, and he just looks so weird. He, he definitely looks like a guy who's caught between styles, who doesn't know whether he's supposed to be a pressure fighter or a back foot fighter. And I really wonder why he has chosen to do this. 
If I had to guess, I'd say that he's been knocked out badly in sparring as a pressure fighter, and that has spooked him. And so he's decided, you know what? I need to switch things up. I need to avoid getting hit as much because when I come forward, I get hit. I don't want to relive what happened where I got knocked out badly in sparring. Again, that may not be the case, but that's my best guess. But he's, something has happened to him in sparring where he's been cleaned out, trying to come forward and be a pressure fighter. And that has caused him to switch up his entire approach to boxing. Now, the commentators were remarking on George Arias's lack of punching power. And that definitely seems to be an issue, which is really strange because Arias, again, very athletic. You know, he can bounce around and all that kind of stuff, despite being a very muscular, you know, thick set kind of guy. He can bounce around. He's very athletic. And he has this powerful build and he's a heavyweight, right? There's not many heavyweights that can't punch. But George Arias appears to be one of those guys. Now, he was having issues getting guys out of there when he was a pressure fighter, when he was coming forward and fighting on the front foot. Now that he's decided to become this back foot counter puncher, he's getting even less power on the shots. <laughs> so for me, it doesn't make any sense. For me, it's going to be even worse for him if he decides to continue down this road of uh, doing this weird back foot stuff. That is, it's like a pressure fighting technique on the back foot. Do you know what I mean? Where he's all crouching low and the way he throws his punches just looks mad awkward for someone who's moving backwards. It just all looks wrong. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't think at this stage that Arias has much of a future at 30 years of age when he's caught between styles. He's apparently looking to campaign at bridge weight now rather than heavyweight, which again suggests that he maybe has had a tough time in sparring against one of these bigger heavyweights. Maybe got cleaned out or something and said, you know what? I need to just fight Bridger weight. These huge six foot seven, 260 pound guys are just too much for me to compete with. So I need to, uh, in fact, there's me asking who's promoting him. It says it right there. <laughs> Dimitri Salita, interesting choice. Has George Arias been in there against Big Baby Miller? Maybe he has, I don't know. So those are my thoughts on... Uh, Arias and his career, and as I say, the Atlante Green fight, it was a relatively competitive fight. And here it doesn't actually have the result, but it was a, I think a UD over eight for George Arias, or was it a split decision? No, I think it was a split decision for Arias over eight rounds. It was a relatively competitive fight. Green was, I think, a bit baffled. He expected Arias to come forward and attack and was taken aback by the fact that he was actually boxing and moving around. <laughs> uh, and he didn't really quite know how to adjust to that. It wasn't until, I want to say, the second half of the fight that Green really got a foothold and started winning some rounds and whatever. Because again, I think he was just thrown off by what Arias was doing. I guess he hadn't seen the Cassius Cheney fight or something because he was doing the same as in Arias in the Cheney fight. So anyway, there you have it. That's my take on George Arias at this stage doesn't look like he's going to go anywhere in the heavyweight division or even in the bridgeweight division for my money unless he switches it up and gets his confidence back and develops his pressure fighting ability. I think to me that just comes far more naturally to him and it looks far more natural. You know, from an, an outsider's perspective looking in, when you watch him fight in a pressure style, it just looks far more him. Do you know what I mean? It just suits him way better than uh, this back foot stuff. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below.